Hi, and welcome everyone. I'm Erica Zeal, creator of Knocked Up Fitness and the Core Rehab Program. And today with me, I have Julie Anna, and I am just so excited to, you know, have some amazing conversation with her and for her to share with you um, a lot of her, you know, what, what she's experienced over the last how many years? Well, <laughs> seven years, right? Because you yeah. know, seven now, right? And then um, so anyway, Juliana is a mom of four. I'm like, I have three. I don't know how she does it with four. And her last two were twins. So she's going to get to share with us some fun, fun things um, and some tips for um, your girl twins. So it's exciting. But one big thing I really wanted to open up a conversation, this kind of came up natural one day um, when we were chatting because she helps write and edit for the Nocta Fitness blog and um, loves to research like I do about pregnancy exercise. There's just so much that, um, you know, out there and we want to get that all out to you. And we were talking one day about, she was telling me how like, you know, with she'd been doing the workouts when she was pregnant with her second. Um, that was when we first started you know, working together and she started working a little bit with the blog and things have just totally grown and morphed since then. <laughs> it's just kind of a natural organic process. But, um, and then, uh, you did do some core rehab, right? In between. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then she got pregnant with twins, which is so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and she worked through the core or the knocked up fitness, uh, membership and things like that. So we just want to talk just, open up and start some conversation to share with all of you moms on the power of not not even just working out but the the core foundation stuff it's so powerful and uh, what it can do to our body we have so much control for our body whether it comes to you know we're talking pelvic floor issues um back pain neck pain so many things that so many moms think come with motherhood because i have heard the story so many times about Oh, well, so-and-so, you know, just says, oh, it's normal that you, you know, pee your pants after you have a couple of children. And I'm like, you know, well, while that may seem normal, it's not okay. And it is something that we can work on. So just a little example. But um, Juliana, I'm going to turn it over to you a little bit. And I just want you to share with all of our listeners like, a little bit about you and kind of your story. You obviously have four kids. And <laughs> so, and you started, um, you know, well, you were active with your first too, right? But we didn't know each other when you were pregnant with your first. Right. Yeah. So I have four total. Um, my oldest is seven and my middle little guy is going to be four soon. And then I have six month old twins. Uh, so it is really busy. Yes. Uh, with my first, before I got pregnant with my first, I was always really active. I started dance when I was really, really little, like three years old. And, um, that kind of snowballed into gymnastics and volleyball and tennis and all that good stuff. So I was always really active. So when I got pregnant with my first, I just kind of assumed, let's keep doing all those things as long as my body lets me. So, uh, so I did stay very active through that pregnancy um, and had, you know, a, a really good labor and uh, really easy pregnancy for the most part, no complications, anything like that. Um, afterwards, about six weeks after, once I had my okay to go ahead, I did notice those little things like, um, kind of felt like there was a weight on my chest when I tried to do core movements and that sort of thing. And that's when I started looking at the abdominal separation and what that entailed. And lo and behold, I had just like a triangle like that, a full on peak when I checked for my abdominal separation. And it was so irritating and painful and uh, embarrassing kind of to, you know, think that I, I knew all of this stuff about exercise and I was a super healthy person. And then I find out that I've really kind of destroyed my body when I didn't need to. So uh, shortly after discovering all that and kind of working towards making it better, it wasn't really making a lot of headway. And that's when I found out for fitness. And it's also when I got pregnant with my second. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of worked out well that way. Um, so I really worked through making sure that I was doing the right kinds of exercises. And I think that is the key difference between the first pregnancy and the second pregnancy for me. With that second pregnancy, I was doing the right movements. I wasn't doing crunches in my second and third trimester because I stayed small. I didn't get like that big beach ball belly that people love and talk about. I, and that was just not my build, but, uh, 
for me, I had to make the connection between just because you're not too big to do it doesn't mean that that's the right movement or the best movement for your body. So that was like a big light bulb for me. So then after uh, the middle guy was born, that's when I started going through the core rehab and I completely healed my abdominal separation. It was gone. I could do whatever I needed to do and there was no separation, no peaking, and it just looked right again. It felt right again. That was the big thing. Awesome. Okay. So I want to, I want to bring up this conversation you mentioned about, you know, like not doing crunches. So with your first, were you doing some like crunch type exercises at the beginning of your pregnancy? I was doing all the same oh. stuff that I did. Yeah, I know. Because for me, I, I was pretty young when I had my first too. So I just kind of said, you know, I'm, I'm young, my body's healthy. I feel great. I'm not, I barely showed until I was about 34 weeks and I had him at 36 weeks. So okay. I had like a belly and then he was out. <laughs> so, uh, so I really, yeah, I continued doing all that same stuff because it, I, I didn't know that it wasn't supposed to feel like it did. I just kind of assumed, okay, well it feels a little different, but yeah, there's like a four or five pound human in there. So it makes right. sense, but uh, never made the connection. So crunches and all kinds of stuff that Really, it was a better solution. <laughs> yeah, so it kept you active, but and again, like, so your oldest is seven, and my oldest is ten, and and I was in the realm of prenatal exercise when I was when I had actually well before I, I ever even got pregnant with my first because I, I loved it from the time of like being in college. So I, I was aware of a lot of things. I had even taken prenatal training um, courses, and they didn't they still didn't really teach you a lot of these, like, don't do crunches. Like they didn't explain the whole why behind it because we didn't even kind of know in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest difference, right, that uh, Juliana noticed with her second and, and what we really teach is it's, it's about getting into the deep core. It's not that you can't work your core. You should work your core. And if we're going to share even more, I'm excited as, uh, as she talks about her twin pregnancy. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, but to think that, okay, she was small and active and she still ended up with diastasis because she wasn't properly engaging through the deep core. That's what it really comes down to. And that's a big thing that we teach. I teach my instructors how to do it in my prenatal um, postnatal exercise specialist course because it's so important. This is something that needs to change within the fitness industry. Like as instructors um, across the board, like this is something that every instructor needs to understand with you know a mom even or a woman even before pregnancy to help prepare her right so if you're listening to this and you're thinking about becoming pregnant like these are things that the sooner you can start learning how to strengthen your core correctly whether i have moms that join core rehab actually before they even get pregnant they reach other like was it is it okay if i start this before i have a baby and i'm like oh yeah absolutely like that's the really the best time um but those moms don't tend or those women don't tend to find um, this teaching is, is soon and sometimes don't always make the connection. Um, and the one other thing that really comes up with the moms I work with and teach that are super active and really fit. And this was me and this was probably you <laughs> was we were really too tight in, uh, in and around like our pelvic floor and our obliques, which can then also create and cause the diastasis and can cause a weaker pelvic floor and things like that because we're trying to work really hard and that's something that it's a little bit of a mental shift that we have to actually come into um, when you do get pregnant but the cool thing is is when you do realize oh hey like let's stop doing crunches let's stop doing crazy high intensity stuff that doesn't really feel amazing for my body and and i know there are women out there that still run and do, still do some high intensity stuff um that's kind of a topic for another day but again <laughs> um the biggest thing is is like when you stop and really listen to your body and realize also pregnancy really is a short period of time in our life right it's really like when you're in it i know i can seem like oh my gosh like i just want to get back to whatever it is you were doing before but I can promise you that when you take a little bit more time to number one, learn, connect with your core and move more appropriately, like it's a game changer. And I'm, you know, it's really like, like I'm even super, super impressed with like, I use, I've worked with obviously a lot of women in person, but like it's Juliana and I, I've never worked with her in person. Everything she's done of mine has been online and more and more women that are going through and, and you know, learning all of this, like it's such a change for not only how their pregnancy goes, but how their birth goes. So I really want to talk some birth talk 
here today and I'm happy to share anything of mine. But um, Juliana, did you notice a difference from your first to your second as far as the labor process? Um, let, let's even open up a conversation about tearing. And I honestly don't even know what your story is on this because we've not talked about it. But from personal experience of mine, I can tell you if you don't tear or you minimally tear and you don't have to have an episiotomy, oh my gosh, your recovery time and your recovery, the way your recovery goes is just day and night. And that is one big thing um, that I'm seeing such a shift in first, so many first time moms going through an active fitness membership, having no tearing. And like, that's blowing me away because even, you know, there's so many women, the first baby, usually you tear a little bit. Um, and the whole episiotomy thing is such an old school. Did you ever have to have an episiotomy? I hope you didn't. No, no, I, um, and I didn't know a lot about it either. So for me, uh, when I had my first, I was in the delivery room requesting, just like, don't let me tear, please don't let me tear, you know, go ahead and do the episiotomy. And I actually had a really great doctor and she was like, no, 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 that's not what you want. <laughs> happened. And I had like a total of two internal stitches, but Ooh. I push for probably an hour. With, with your first. Yeah. Okay. Now that's not terrible. I certainly... <laughs> I can't complain, yeah. um, but I was very, very tired, obviously. That's like a, a, and for a first two, and he was a good size. He was over seven pounds. Um, the difference between my first and my second, because like you said, I was very tight because I was doing those same exercises uh, that I was doing pre-pregnancy and in you know high school and university and that sort of thing. So uh, that tightness, I think, caused me to maybe not make the connection with my body on how to push. The difference between my first and my second, doing the push prep and the correct movements and learning what my body was supposed to do and also having that previous experience, having a delivery, like four pushes and the second one was out, no tearing, no stitches, no, I didn't even have a fluid IV while I was in the hospital. It was, wow. yeah, they, oh, uh, they actually, I love yeah, it. <laughs> they came in and, uh, did the assessment on us both uh, the next morning. He was born at 2.53 in the afternoon. So the next morning came in. I was like, yep, yeah, you're good to go home. And then about five minutes later, he came in. I was packing up my stuff and he said, actually, we have to keep you for 24 hours. So <laughs> just have lunch and then go ahead. <laughs> oh, so night and day difference in just that preparation of understanding the function of how to push because that's a huge part of it because your body needs to know that it's supposed to do that movement because if all you're doing is tightening everything up it's painful <laughs> more than it needs to be absolutely and, and and i know i'm gonna come on i'm gonna say this just because i know there's gonna be moms that are gonna be like well second baby should come quicker absolutely yes but when you have that little extra knowledge and your body is even better prepared you're, it just goes that much smoother. I can't tell you how many moms have had rough labors and then they end up learning the push prep and learning, and, and even the foundational. You have to learn the foundational stuff before you actually incorporate it. Just really dive into the push prep. Um, and that's one thing I, I always want to say is moms want to like, during the membership, be like, I want your push prep. I'm like, great, that's awesome. But here you need to learn the foundational. I need you to learn how to strengthen. I need you to learn how to release and relax. And not only relax your pelvic floor, I'm taking this a step deeper and, and really getting you to release through the hips. Like our hips spread when we're pregnant for a reason. And I and I know it's hard sometimes as a woman to think, oh my gosh, my hips are spreading, my belly is getting bigger. But I want you to embrace that. The more we embrace the changes that are going on, yet also realize that we do have control on, on the support that we can, we can strengthen our body. That takes a little bit of work. A little bit of work can go a long way. And it doesn't have to be so extreme. You don't have to work out an hour a day. I mean, if you want to, that's amazing. I always encourage, you know, if you can work out 20, 30 minutes most days of the week, that's ideal. But for everybody, I know that's not ideal, or for everybody, I know that's not possible. And that's okay because we get tired, lethargic, even if you're someone who is super active before pregnancy. But again, these foundational moves, maybe it's you spend 10, 15 minutes every day just working on the deep core, strengthening, releasing, going through. We've added new, some newer workouts um, that are a little bit calmer and a little bit more about the releasing and relaxing through some simple movements that really anybody can do. Take your time through them because it's such a game changer. But when we really allow things to open up and, and spread, because here's the thing, 
there's a baby coming out down there and every time the contraction comes and we grip and pull back up, that's really for a lot of women to slow down labor or the pushing phase, right? And I know Julianne and I both noticed this um, with ours because that was me with well, with the first one, like I, I went into it. My husband laughs at me because I, I thought I was prepared with my first. I was twenty three. How old were you when you had your first? I was not quite twenty yet, actually. Oh wow. Okay, so I couldn't remember. I was like, oh, okay, I think she's a little younger. And okay, well, good. See, we were both young, and like you know, we we, kind, we thought we kind of knew, you know, with that first one. And then you look back and you're like, wow, I had no, <laughs> like I knew pretty little exercise, but I hadn't learned this stuff I hadn't learned. They, no one was teaching you the importance of allowing things to release and open up. And so that's where with my first, I did end up with an episiotomy. I don't know why I was an old school doctor and I did have to end up having an epidural when I went into like, oh, it's going to happen fast because I'm active. And, and well, it did happen fast. Absolutely. It was a, like you start pushing and it was like the doctor kind of like just was like, okay, push as hard as you can and get baby out. And we now know that's not, that's not the way you should do it. We don't want to push with all of our might. And that's, and that's also with, with what, you know, we teach in the active fitness membership. It's not about just being able to push forcefully. That's, that's not, that's not the goal. The goal is that when you learn how to strengthen and how to release that you then also, if needed, for say an emergency delivery and you are then going to be strong enough to push baby out in you know 10 minutes 20 minutes 30 minutes most moms are pushing babies out in less than 30 minutes and again it's it's not about forceful and fast but if needed it could help to prevent an emergency cesarean birth um, or potential other complications so that's where it's like it's so powerful and for me it was with my second that I really connected and figured out this whole push prep thing and anyone really realized that I had been doing it um, except for the fact that when he was born, he did have the cord wrapped around his neck and doctors will not let you push. If you, especially like where the way he was, the doctor with me was, and I didn't even know how scared it was at the time because they were not, obviously they're going to scare mom, you know, they need you to be in it to like get baby out. And so she was basically like, like I had already done this before. So I knew the process. Right. And I knew that by then I was like, okay, I know he doesn't have to come out and push one. There's no reason for that. Right. So we can give the body a little bit of time to work baby down. And like literally on after the first contraction of like pushing him, he was like, okay, you have to push as hard as you possibly can. And I was like, what? And she's like reaching for the vacuum and all this stuff to like get him out as quickly as possible. And I pushed him out in like three pushes. And that was all. She was not going to let me go um, any longer and they would have rushed me in for an emergency C-section, which then is just more stress on mom and baby. And of course, I, I'm cesarean births are there for a reason, right? For health of mom and getting baby out. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. But if we can be better prepared to help in preventing those, which is exactly what I experienced with my son. It's, it's just a nice feeling to know, okay, I, I, I learned all of this and I was able to do this. So um, that's really where that whole, the push prep from my end came about. It was like, I think six months or something later. And there was a conversation going on with my husband because he used to be a paramedic. And so he's like, oh my gosh, every baby she has is so stressful for me because he's doing the APGAR score in his head when they're born and all this stuff. And, you know, and so it's, it's pretty stressful for him, but he, him and a girlfriend of mine who was a nurse, they were talking about all this, you know, with my son's birth. And I was like, oh, it was that Bad. like you guys didn't tell me it was so bad. like they totally kept me in the dark until he was like six months old you know and I was like huh and it like totally connected the dots for me and I was like we need to be teaching moms this because if I hadn't understood at that time how to really connect my transverse and push with that releasing because by then I knew I had to release more with his birth for my first um I'm like, wow, this can really help moms that need that extra pushing power when needed. And so that's the really cool thing about it. Some moms, the uterus is the strongest muscle to do the work. Sometimes we need a little extra assistance. <laughs> well, and the other thing too, right, is what is the downfall of being a more effective pusher? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> and, and I mean, if you're tired and exhausted and you're pushing for hours and it's not effective pushing, you're really just uh, walking into territory of possibly needing that section because your body at some point is going to say, I can't anymore. <laughs> wow. And so if you really have that connection and that foundation to be able to sort of have an out-of-body experience and really uh, 
know in your head and be confident that you can focus on those muscles and your body knows what to do, the less you have to worry about those outlying things. And you can really just spend that time focusing on the job that needs to be done and excitement for baby. Yeah. And when you're, when labor goes a little bit smoother, your recovery, and even in the hospital, like you just feel so much better. Yeah. I had three different experiences. And like my experience with my third, even though I was induced, um, was day and night, like there was no tearing and all of that. And I was like, wow, if someone would have told me with baby number one that this was possible, I would have been like, I'm in because I, after my first without episiotomy, like that was so painful for so long. Um, that scar tissue and to be a little TMI, but again, we don't talk about this. I've never had anyone tell me, oh, you shouldn't get an, I didn't even know what a episiotomy was until after I had one. Right. And then you have to deal with the suffering of it. Um, but that scar tissue was there for a good nine years and yeah. you could feel it and it sucks. It sucks. So unless you absolutely have, I, I, I know in a rare occasion they are needed. Yes. Um, but again, when we do this prep work, it can really, really help. So, um, I want to have, I want you to talk about your, your twins. So in between you worked on core rehab, you had no diastasis or you, you worked. Okay. Let me ask you this. So your first, you did have some diastasis after your second, you still, did you still have a little bit or it wasn't bad? It, like okay. pretty much was, uh, mostly healed. I, I'm assuming that the second pregnancy, I was kind of working on it before I got pregnant with him, but it was pretty close to when we got pregnant. So I started kind of going back through starting from square one and doing the prenatal stuff again. Right, okay. So just from that alone, just from doing the prenatal stuff and the correct movements and working through a full nine months of pregnancy, there was a huge difference in the separation and in how I felt. So after I had him, uh, there was a little bit of that separation. Obviously there was a seven and a half pound baby in there. There things open up, uh, but everything kind of went back to where it should have been in the first place quite quickly. So well, I want to talk about that briefly because more, I get a lot of moms that are like, okay, can I do work on my diastasis? I'm pregnant again. And they didn't, you know, maybe they came across where we have, and they're like, but I'm pregnant again. Can I do anything? And I'm like, absolutely. And it really, again, it, I'm just so amazed at what these things can do. These little bits of knowledge that you can learn because when we do have the separation, um, even if you are pregnant, you can work to close it. There's actually a lot of moms I know out there that have learned, once you learn how to properly strengthen and what exercises to do, are seeing that their diastasis is closed after a second or third, fourth pregnancy, whatever it might be. So it's very common that I hear that a lot. So anyway, I wanted to talk about that. Okay, so then you work through core rehab, got your core even stronger and better, but I say stronger, not in a gripping sense, in a deep fascial sense. So that's one thing when I say the word strong, there is this whole idea that we actually can be too strong. Like we mentioned about the gripping, we were both, you know, used to grip. <laughs> <laughs> it happens when you're an athlete and because yeah. we're not taught any different, any differently. And so you have to kind of like stumble across all this and learn this and learn how to release and relax and how to properly connect deeply. And it, it takes time, but if you never start, you'll never you'll never learn it. And, and the cool thing about it is it's setting you up for such great, uh, core strength, um, in a, in a deep fascia layer. And so when I say fascia, if you're not sure what that is, it's, it's the connective tissue through your body. And we have fascial sheaths that run through our abdominal wall. So when we learn how to tap into that, it really can help with the diastasis, help with our abdominal connection. Um, but it also affects our whole body because it runs through our whole body. So um, again, not to get too off topic there with the fascia, but just to mention it, it's a lot of what I end up teaching you is really you're learning how to activate and get into not only the muscular system correctly, but really the fascia because it connects everything together. So, And it's amazing how you notice too when that fascia is stronger, your, your stomach is actually flatter. And you would think, you know, a lot of people think, well, if I, you know, I do the right exercises to build my abs, abs are what's going to give me a nice flat stomach. <laughs> but if you're weak and loosey goosey on the inside, you're still going to have that, that bloating, that bulge and all that stuff. So if you're wanting that flat stomach after having two, three, four babies, uh, you need to work from the inside out. It's like anything, right? You can't just uh, put a little mask on the front and call it a day. Right. But, uh, so with, yeah, with my, my twins, that was 
my biggest fear was, you know, you see, uh, first thing I did when we found out they were twins, because they were a surprise for us, uh, didn't really expect there was going to be two. Uh, I was super sick, but that was really the only hint that I had. So first thing I'm, of course, in my head Googling is what physically is this going to do? Because I don't have twins in my family. I don't know a lot of people who have had twins. So I'm Googling the worst. I'm going to, you know, like giant twin bellies and like wanting to see what limits my body is going to stretch to. And I don't recommend doing that at all. Yeah, I was like, don't do that. Don't no, do that. No, no. But in my, in my head, I was thinking I was preparing myself for what was going to happen. Um, so I, I really had to take a step back and focus on making sure that I was preparing my body for these gigantic stretches basically because instead of one seven pound baby potentially I could have had two in there they were both born at five pounds 15 ounces so that's I had like 12 pounds and three feet of baby in there when I delivered them three feet I like how you put that I'm like that's that's awesome it's, it's a lot of person to fit inside a person <laughs> so uh I mean but I every day very religiously was working on even just you know doing some deep core breathing at my desk at work or uh going home and doing some cat cow stretches and um, articulating the abdominal muscles and my back muscles. And I could feel a difference. I could tell that my body was carrying it very easily and very well. And, uh, and it felt good to feel good, especially, you know, knowing that there was two there, I had people saying, you know, you're going to be on bed rest at 20 some odd weeks. Cause I had my first at 36 weeks. Mm -hmm. So, and twins typically come a bit earlier uh, and there are a lot of people who have their twins in the late twenties and early 30 weeks. So I really wanted to make sure not only was I fueling my body to make sure these babies grew as much as possible, as fast as possible, the right way, uh, on a healthy diet and with good exercise, uh, to back it up. But I wanted my body to be strong enough to carry them. And I actually, uh, shy of five days, that was the longest that I carried a pregnancy. <laughs> my oldest was born at 36. My youngest was born at 38. And these guys were born at 37 and five. So, and that was actually, um, I hadn't gone into labor yet. We had a, a footling breach for the first baby. So we did end up having to have a section, um, which was not what I wanted. I was really had this, uh, glorified idea of having this natural twin birth and and so I had to um for me I had to cope with that but how fast my recovery was and how well I healed up from a section was night and day from what I had thought it was going to be oh, I did have a lot of pain I did you know notice a big difference between that and a natural vaginal birth I with my second one I had no uh, not even an IV with, I was up crouched on the bed the next day with my nieces and my nephew and, and they were kind of mauling over the baby and that sort of thing. Uh, with the section, it took me about two weeks to be able to, you know, do a full crunch to sit up in bed. I was really having to roll over and tilt to the side and, and there was two babies to pick up. So, um, I really didn't want to have the section, but it was what was safest for the babies. So that's why we prepare for everything. Yes. And, uh, and I think doing the, especially, I really felt like the, the cat cow stretches and the deep breathing and that sort of thing. Um, my sister actually joked, I sent her, I would never send anybody this in the rest of the entire world. But the day after my section, I sent her a picture of my staples and where it was. Cause nobody in my family had ever had a section before. Okay. And uh, she was like, you look like Frankenstein. You look like somebody just open you up and put you back together again because it was so seamless. And in my, uh, in my surgery, actually, my, my husband will chuckle because in my surgery, the doctor, when she was putting me back together, basically, so when we back up, she said, you're just, you've made my job way too easy. Like it, mm -hmm. it just was this aha moment that everything that I had worked at, uh, even though I didn't get the birth that I wanted, I had the best possible experience from having a section. And uh, I think that's something that maybe we don't always think about. Oh, well, if, you know, I know I'm going to have to have a section. I already had one before. I know I'm going to have to have a section because of 
uh, placenta issues or whatever, so I don't need to train for labor. Well, <laughs> I beg to differ because the recovery and being put back together again after surgery is not fun. And I feel like preparing my body for labor and birth, it's still labor and birth, even if it's not a, you know, a vaginal delivery or a drug free delivery or all of these really glossy, nice things that we like to dream about. Um, you're, you've still had a baby. You still carried baby for nine months and your body still needs to be trained to respond to that. So I really, uh, I really felt like that was a big aha. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I, I really got, because I feel like so many women, I guess, whether you're planning a cesarean for a needed reason or it's just a choice, there is that. And I do get women that ask like, okay, well, do I need to learn your push prep if I'm going to have a cesarean? I'm like, well, you don't really have to learn the push prep, but you do, you can still really greatly benefit, um, not only for preparing for a cesarean birth, because that can help your recovery. And like Juliana mentioned with her doctor, what her doctor noticed when she was in at surgery is the tissue was probably so nice and like smooth. And so it just made like her cutting and putting it, everything back together and sewing everything up was like, it's probably almost effortless because if we have that nice smooth striation of the fascial lines, um, it's just, it, it makes things easier. There's this nice communication. And while, even though it does get cut, um, because that, that muscle memory is there, that great energy of the fascia line is there because she's been working for so long. And this is the one thing too, is you'll see from one pregnancy to the next, it just gets better and better and better. And that comes back to, it does take time because it takes time at a cellular level for our fascia to create more. And so like for, like if we should, we've got scar tissue. And this is one thing that comes up with cesarean births. Like women end up with that scar tissue. And the biggest thing is it's numb. Will I ever get sensation back? And absolutely you can. And I want you to, can you address that? Did you get numbing initially with that? Or could you? I, oh, oh. I had panic um, after, well, the second or third day, because the first day, you know, it was you know, painful, obviously it's a, it's an incision, a large incision. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I had like sort of a burning sensation around the skin and that sort of thing. So, um, for the first couple of days, I was just basically taping an ice pack over it and, and trying to make sure that the swelling was minimal and wanted to get a good gauge, a good idea of what it was going to look like, because this was basically my nightmare. I really didn't want a section. It was, it was from 2010 when I had my first, I was like, the only thing I really don't want is a section. Whatever happens, I don't want a section. And ultimately there's things that you can't control. So I ended up with one. Um, and then in the following weeks, I did notice I was pretty much numb from the top of my belly button to, um, uh, where my hips kind of adjoined to my legs. Like I had a huge Wow. area of numbness. And I was beside myself. I thought, you know, what if I never have feeling there again? Oh. And uh, I really, I was uh, mortified. I thought I was going to have no feeling in that skin. And uh, it was scary. It's, and it's that weird feeling too. Like if, even if you've had something small, like, you know, dental work and you, you're numb and it's your body knows that that body part is there, but to touch it on the outside, it feels so odd. Oh. And, uh, within, I would say within two months, I had almost full feeling back. And I think that's, you know, a testament to the blood flow and that sort of thing too. I mean, if your, your body is able to heal yeah. and you give it time to, I basically for the first two months was in my chair with two babies nursing two babies. Um, and the only thing that I did other than get up and down to get water and go to the bathroom was, uh, just like the, the deep breathing, the core connection. And I would sit and nurse them and I would do those in and out Kegels over and over a couple of times a day, just to kind of regain the sensation back in that area. And it wasn't because I had had a vaginal delivery and I needed to work on that particular part, but because that works the whole inside right from where I had no feeling at the top of the belly button down into the pelvic floor right down at the bottom and whether or not you have a vaginal delivery all of that area is affected just by the pregnancy all connected yeah 
So it's a full sensation back now though, right? Full sensation back now. Now they're six months old and I would say since they were about three months, I had pretty much full sensation. Um, of course your, your incision always feels a little bit odd and on the inside, you know, you can feel if you palpate over the skin, but I have such minimal scar tissue there even. And, uh, of course I prepared myself mentally for the worst and I mean, they're only six months old and I, my scar is so minimal and the, uh, even like the scar tissue, the deep scar tissue where you can feel when you palpate over it is so minimal that it doesn't even affect me. And, and emotionally, I thought actually a big thing emotionally, I thought having a section was going to affect me because I was so proud of my, my first two deliveries. And I felt so great about how they had gone so smoothly and, and they were natural and this and that, but, uh, the, the, whether or not they came out by a regular delivery or section, I, it doesn't make a difference in the long run of how you feel about your, your pregnancy experience if you're healthy for the pregnancy and everybody comes out okay. Yeah. Okay. So now that scar tissue, that little bit that you still feel, it will continue because you you connect. And one thing I want to mention just to clarify. So when Juliana was talking about doing kegels, right? The biggest thing we have to understand is we have to understand how to do them correctly. And you notice how she mentioned she's working on her kegels and it's, it's working everything up through her abdominal wall and deep within the core. That's the biggest thing. Traditional kegels um, that I feel a lot of moms come back to me and say that their OB tells them, oh, just like squeeze, it's like right in the middle, like you're yeah. or like this big. You guys, your pelvic floor is not this big. Um, it is like, okay, so it's thin, yes, but your pelvic floor, I always like do my little diamond shape, okay? So it goes from the front of your pubic bone You've got the middle, your vagina, and then back underneath your butt cheeks. And so that is, if you can start to understand and visualize, wow, that's how big and how much area my pelvic floor is underneath, then that's when we start to connect deeper through the core. It's not just the middle. We can't just pull up the middle. We have to be, and we have to be able to feel expansion and pulling together and then connecting and lengthening upward. It's no longer just working the pelvic floor on its own. It's not bad to do periodically to like, you know, I've talked to, um, talked to many uh, pelvic floor physical therapists because I'm always like, okay, what, what else can we learn here? And there will be some that will cue their patients just to, you know, do some quick little quick of the pelvic floor only. That's not bad. But what the whole point of that is just to kind of wake up just the pelvic floor. But for optimal connection, then it's where we need to lengthen and connect the whole thing. And the breath is so powerful, like Juliana was talking about, is when you're sitting there nursing, you can do this stuff without actually having to set aside time in your day. And that is like one of my biggest things I've been working on this last year, year and a half is really trying to, we've added, uh, I don't remember how long ago it was, we added new tutorials in the Max of Fitness membership. We've added new workout sense that are, you know, short, but so you can walk away with understanding, okay, this is my breath. This is how I should be carrying my body. This is how I should be carrying my baby. And those little things that you can implement into your life, um, they're game changers. And core rehab is a big one. And that's where I really emphasize like, Hey, get your, if you can get your work at it, great. But you know what? If you can't, that's okay. Because you're learning how to do this breath work. You're learning how to connect, how to carry your body, how to do all these things in your day to day. And that's where we really see the long-term big results. Yes. Doing the workouts because we need to learn. And there's certain movements that you'll find will really help you connect with your core um, really well that you can do while you're on the ground with your little ones. And so the goal behind all of this is not to make it complex and like, oh my gosh, I have to work out for an hour a day. Again, if that's you, great, do it, but incorporate the deep core correct stuff as like your warm up, And then you go from there. But it's, it's about learning and doing what you can as a mom, because we're all busy. We're exhausted. Again, are you getting any sleep? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I do. Uh, they're they're actually not too bad. The twins are pretty good. They uh, they get usually like a three to four hour stretch from that midnight to four a.m. is where we get our best sleep. But what's really important that you said there, like you don't have to set aside an hour. If I tried to set aside an hour to do uh, anything, is not going to happen. What I do do is I keep my weights in my hall closet in the front of my house. I have my yoga mat rolled out 24 seven. I just kind of make things more accessible. I have my exercise band over a door frame actually. So I can do pull downs when I walk past it. And if you're doing 
10 or 12 of those every time you walk past the door and you're connecting your deep core and doing the correct breaths, it takes five minutes when you're walking down the hall putting laundry away and you're getting that five or 10 times a day. And it makes a huge difference. For me, I find that I get my best uh, kind of exercise by being able to chip away at it throughout my day, three or four times. Now I do set aside time that I do an actual routine, uh, but to be able to fit in everything that you need to do in a day, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be rocket science. It doesn't have to be um, military scheduled. You can really customize, especially once you get comfortable with the program too, because once you're comfortable and you've run through it and you uh, have all those concepts, this is my kind of third time through uh, trying to exercise after baby. So once you kind of know what to do and what feels right and when it doesn't feel right, which is the other big important part. To mention is to know when you're not, your body's not quite ready. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's a, and everybody progresses at, at a different rate. And, and the one thing is like, the more you've been working on it, the better your fascial connections are, the quicker you're going to recover and the easier you can move through, say for instance, like it's the core rehab. Like if you've done it after your first or second baby, and then you have another one and you do it again, like the connections are going to come so much easier that time. And I've got a lot of moms that um, have done, gone through core rehab and then they started it over and they were like, Oh my gosh, it's like a whole different program the second or third time you do it. So it's it's just amazing because it comes down to you might start moving and be like, I am not feeling anything you're saying. And that's okay. That's normal. That is very normal when you first begin. But the cool thing is once you learn this stuff, it's like, it's really a life changer. And it's stuff that sets you up for just amazing, you know, lifelong habits for your core because so many women, and it seems to be women is when they get into their fifties and then sixties, that's when we start to have like pelvic floor issues and all this stuff. And women after the fact I've worked with and they come to me and they're like, yeah, I, everything totally fell out down there. And when I say that to my clients, they're like, wait, stuff can really fall out down there. <laughs> I can literally say that sometimes to kind of like get people to listen to me. I'm like, no, I'm serious. You need to like, listen to me when I'm telling you how to strengthen your car. Yeah. And, but it's, it's, it's sad when I, when I have these conversations with, um, you know, women that have had to then go have a hysterectomy because they had no other choice. They're sur they went to a surgeon and they're like, well, what do surgeons do? They take things out. They cut things up. Like what if that's what they do? Um, but if, if they, you know, even had any sort of recognition about, oh, well, I could have been preventing this stuff when I, you know, I had three babies that were in their twenties, you know, and I knew nothing about that. Right. And so it's, it's amazing what a little bit of prevention and cause I get a lot of women that are like, well, I don't have any of these issues. It, am I still going to benefit? I'm like, uh, yeah, because just because you don't have them now, maybe you're 20 or 25 or even 35 or 40, it, it doesn't mean it's never going to happen to you. So anyway, just something to, to think about as far as on the prevention side. Um, I was going to ask you, oh, diastasis. So after your twins, and, and she, you were exceptionally small. Like it, I would have never, so if you, someone just saw you walking down the street, you did not look like you had twins. I, I had a lot of, um, with all three of my pregnancies actually, but especially with the twins, I had a lot of people um, asked me if I was sure if I was that far along or, you know, make comments about actually in the delivery room with my middle, um, I kind of had the doctor had a little bit of a panic, like, um, wasn't quite sure if this is going to be a really premature baby because I just, I don't, I think my babies sit far back and where my abdominals, I really work on that reach around, um, affect the hug your baby. So everything sort of stays, um, fairly linear. I don't get, like I said, I don't get that big beach ball. And I don't know if, uh, if you've seen, uh, the picture of me the morning before the delivery with the twins, I think so. Uh, you can see like where my abdominal muscles are on the outside. And they're obviously they're, they're open. Like they separate because there's two babies in there. Right. But, uh, basically by the time I could sit up at a bed on my own within that two, three week period, um, without being in too, too much pain from surgical site, my abdominal muscles were pretty much right back together again, which after twins, I don't know if, if, if that is as exciting for everyone else as it is for me. It is for me. I, I love it. I know what you've been doing and I'm like, 
it works. It's amazing. It, it, is, it is crazy. It is so uh, amazing what your body is capable of doing. And I, by no means, worked out hard. I was very, very sick the whole pregnancy. I was sick every single day for the entire 37 weeks, five days. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of times didn't have the energy to put in a full workout. We when I say we, I mean me and the older two boys, my seven-year-old, my three-year-old, um, we would have kind of date night where we would roll out a yoga mat and we would do a knockout fitness video together. <laughs> the boys had like those little one and three pound weights and they would do their movements and, and it was kind of our family time and it, it brought some joy to, um, not feeling the greatest. And also, they were saying, you know, when are we going to do our workout? And it was a good way to. So I had like little coaches in the background. That's so cute. Um, but but it does. It makes a huge difference to how you feel after. And I'm I'm six months out, but I would have been comfortable three months out going wow. out in my normal clothes and uh, not feeling like I have you know that that overlapping bubble that you sometimes get from. Uh, a cesarean delivery because that is you know when you google cesarean deliveries or when you're looking up what happens after you get that um that flap or that pooch or whatever yeah, you call it that's you don't have to. like that's having that's from that's caused by just not having um good fascial connection through the abdominal so this is where i get I, surprisingly women that will reach out and be like, Oh, should I do your program? Or actually, I think I'm just going to wait till after I have my baby. And I'm like, no, because yeah. you can do so much while you are pregnant. And again, it like Julianne mentioned, you don't have to like work out like crazy. No. And that's one thing that I realized in like, right. Everything kind of started in like teaching the prenatal exercise side. And then in through doing all this over however many years, it's been, <laughs> I'm like, there's so much power and just, learning about the deep core and you don't have to just you know again you don't have to work out like crazy um but a little bit really goes a long way and it's that education piece of really learning how to correctly do it and again i get moms that are like oh, i'm 36 weeks so i still have time i'm like yes absolutely because it is amazing and pregnancy the cool thing about pregnancy that i love obviously besides the fact that you're growing another human being or two it's fascinating but that you have so much control over your own body and what you can do to you have babies inside of you or baby or, you know over many and you can you know <laughs> that tactile feedback and that is such an amazing experience that when you can feel that you are setting your body up for such you know an easier pregnancy hopefully better birth and then the recovery and that's that recovery that we don't talk about enough because so much stuff can happen. Not only do you get hormones that can go crazy and if you're trying to nurse and you know, whatever it might be, if your body's really malnourished and things like that we, we can see the increase in potential postpartum depression. There's also, I don't want to get too off topic on this, but if you feel good, if you physically feel better, that helps to squash a lot of those things that can kind of creep in postpartum. Yeah. So that's like my biggest, I guess, point with this is when we take a little time and again, it's, it's maybe not always setting aside time to work out structurally. That's great when you can, but don't feel bad if you can't, when you weave this into your life, yeah. it can really affect how you feel. And as a mother, right, we have so many things going on, especially if you're working or even if you're a stay at home mom and you've got four kids, like whatever it is, like there's, we're demanding so much, it seems like. And then we're really hard on ourselves <laughs> at the end of the day too. So many of us are like, we want to do this, 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 and this, and like be the best mom, be the best wife, and like try to get all this stuff done. And sometimes it's just flat out hard. And if we feel physically not amazing, that really affects how you feel emotionally as well. And our emotions are super tied in with our fascia and it's quite incredible. Like one good example is I notice this especially with women for warriors or we're stressed, it goes right to your hips. So when we can start to work on, and this is something that I don't talk about it enough, but if you're starting to learn this and you start to open some things up, whether it's with the during pregnancy or it's postpartum with core rehab and you feel this flood of emotion like you need to cry, I want you to cry because we hold so much in our body physically. 
that affects us emotionally and vice versa. So that's why the physical aspect is so important. Even if you're not someone who is a, you know, wants to work out like crazy, you don't have to. So it's just, it's just such, it's that quality of life. And when you can feel a little bit better, wow, it really, it really can improve, you know, how you are as a mother and re respond to your kids. Like, cause if you're t super tired, your body aches and you have a shorter fuse, right? Like I remember a phase after I had my third and I realized I like, I was like, I probably needed to like nourish even more. Um, we don't, aren't always encouraged, but we need a lot of that DHA and the omegas and things like that to really boost our brain function. And if you're so sleep deprived and say so you don't feel good, you just have a shorter fuse with your kids and you're like, I don't want to be like this, but what do I do? You know? So this is one big piece that you can do and it can really just, it can just improve, you know, how, how you feel about life. So physical tension and tension in your body, especially like your low back and your hips and that sort of thing that throws off your whole attitude, your personality, your mood, how you feel, how you perform in your exercise and your, your relationships day to day. So, I mean, learning just how to take two minutes to open up your hips and stretch out your low back and that sort of thing. That is like a huge part of feeling like a good, healthy, normal human being, especially when you've got four kids running around. <laughs> right. Okay. So I feel like we've talked about, so is there anything else that you would like to add? Little tips. I liked your tips about how you kind of have stuff set up around your house. <laughs> how my house is a jungle gym. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's great with the kids. And then they see that too. And I think when you, I actually, I know when kids see their mom be active, at least to some degree, it doesn't have to be crazy. Like it's fun. It's interactive and let your kids join in with you. Um, I don't, I don't film videos specifically with kids. I just, again, for me, because if you are able to set aside time just for yourself, that's great too, but I know it's not always possible. So do what you can do. So is there, if you have any other tips to share? Well, I kind of want to leave with, with two sort of things together. Um, the first one is not very many people think that they're going to leave their pregnancy years feeling better, stronger, more in shape. And they see it on, you know, Instagram or whatever. And they think, okay, well, that's that person. Um, I don't have a ton of time or a fancy gym membership or um, really the ability to leave my house without several humans. <laughs> but I feel better and stronger and more connected with my body now than I did when I was oh, 19. And cool. I've got well, little kids. <laughs> yeah, they're there, and they're there. And our time is up, though. No. <laughs> Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Um, but I do feel that it's, uh, it's really important to make sure that you're taking that time just to understand your body. You don't have to, uh, do anything crazy. It doesn't have to be, um, a massive change in your life. You're making small changes and those small changes are doing big things. This is the middle child, <laughs> the free spirit. I love it. Oh my gosh. I am so, just thank you so much. I'm so grateful for you and that you had been able to experience all these things so we can talk about it with our moms. And I'm sure we'll write some um, more blog posts and stuff. Uh, you, you're an amazing writer. Um, I love that she's able to thank help you. write and I wow. speak. So <laughs> it's amazing. So thank you so much. And moms, if you have questions, please ask, um, you know, if anyone has any, I, this, I'm an open book. So <laughs> yeah, I love, I love it. And so if you have any questions, please, you know, I know we're going to put this, um, on YouTube and in the blog. So leave comments and ask us. And, um, because we're really here to support moms and share that there is so much that you can do. We want to empower you to again feel better after you've had four kids than before. It's awesome. I love it. So thank you so much. And yeah, we'll do this again another time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.